Imagine rare disease, rare disease health information delivered well. A theme of the previous UK rare disease strategy was patient empowerment, and the new UK rare disease framework identifies the need to increase awareness of rare disease amongst healthcare professionals and for better coordination of care. It's implicit to all these themes that patients with rare disease and those providing their care have access to reliable information about the rare condition that affects them or their patients. So that's the subject of this session. How can we get good information about rare disease available to those who need it? So I'd like to extend a warm welcome to Tim Ringrose, the CEO and co-founder of the Cognitant Group, John Lee Taggart from Neiman Pick UK, and Dan Louis from Pulse Info Frame and the Cats Foundation, who are going to discuss this topic. So please feel free to add your comments and questions into the chat or the Q&A. Thanks. Over to you, Tim. Thanks, Gemma. I'm just going to share my screen. Right, well, I'm delighted to be here with you this morning. And with me, I've got two other speakers, as you, as you mentioned. We have John Taggart, who's the Communications and Campaigns Manager for Neiman Pick UK, a, a charity which supports those affected by the group of ultra rare conditions, Neiman Pick. And his work focuses on, one, on patient and family support, awareness campaigns, and the promotion of rare diseases uh, more broadly. And we have Dan, Dan Louis, Dan's eldest daughter, Amelie, was diagnosed with Tay-Sachs uh, back in 2011 when she was 15 months old and on finding that wasn't there wasn't a dedicated UK charity for uh, people affected by that condition he and his wife Patricia set up the Cure and Action for Tay Sachs Foundation CATS. Dan is also head of business development and patient advocacy at Pulse InfoFame and a colleague of mine at Cognizant Group. And guys I'm glad you've got the memo, memo up about wearing a dark shirt this morning so thanks for doing that. So, information first of all. We, we all know that we live in the information age and our lives have been transformed by the ability to access information quickly and easily using computers, smartphones and, and, and now even smartwatches. So we know what weather to expect, you know, what our friends and family are doing, we can book train tickets and holidays and shop online for just about anything. And on top of that, artificial intelligence is already becoming ubiquitous. We might not realize it, but we're being analyzed, nudged and directed by algorithms uh, so many, many times a day. So we might expect that our health is benefiting from all this data and intelligence, but is that our experience? Do we really think that we're benefiting in the way that we should be from all this capability? Well, I think one of the reasons that we're not getting the full value is that there are some also, also some problems with this information age. And one of them is what I like to call the information paradox. And that is that actually, the more information that is available to us, the harder it is to find the right information that we can trust and that answers our particular needs. The second is that amongst all the good information that we now have access to, there's also bad information. Now, some of this is not intended to be harmful. It might be done with the greatest of intent, and you could call that misinformation. But some of it is intended to be harmful, and I think that's what we should call disinformation. So the end result of this is that when we naturally go to a search engine such as Google to try to find answers to our, our health issues, we're just as likely, perhaps more likely than not, to find bad information, good information. And sometimes it's easy for us to be able to tell the difference, um, but other times it's actually very hard and we don't know what to believe. And misinformation is also spread on social media. So it's really hard not to believe something that's just been shared with you by a friend or a relative on WhatsApp or, or Facebook, for, ex for example. And we've experienced this, I think, with COVID and the many, many rumors that have been spread online. It can be incredibly exasperating and much more importantly, downright harmful. And, and as President Biden recently put it very succinctly about misinformation, he said, it's killing people. And, and I believe it really is. In fact, uh, a recent survey by Gallup uh, showed that uh, on average, 57% of internet users across all parts of the world 
um, sorry, we're worried about misinformation. And many more of us worry about misinformation more than we worry about online fraud. When it comes to our health, uh, medical consultations are something that we really rely on. Now, sadly, not all doctors have all the right answers, as we've just been hearing from the last panel. Um, and sometimes we wait a long time to see the right professional to get the answers to our, our problems and, and get, uh, get some answers. And we rely on medical professionals in these consultations to help us understand what's going on, whether we have unexplained symptoms, whether we need investigations, whether we're looking for a diagnosis or we're looking for some uh, advice on the best treatment. So you could regard the medical consultation as the, the bedrock of healthcare. And it's our chance to talk to an expert and get answers. The medical consultation can, of course, be life-changing. But, however, as, as a method of communicating information, there are some problems with the medical consultation. And in some ways, you could regard, regard the medical consultation as we have it at the moment, as incredibly inefficient. And there are a number of reasons for this. And there's, there's three I'd like to talk about. The first is that there just isn't enough time in most consultations to be able to get answers to all our questions. So you might be waiting months to go to see somebody and come away feeling that you haven't had the chance to ask all the questions. The second is that, you know, sadly, professionals still use a lot of jargon and confusing terms in these consultations. And so we may not want to admit it at the time, but we, we, we may not understand everything that's being discussed. And the third, which is probably the biggest issue, is that it's very stressful and it's often very hard to remember everything that's been discussed in the consultation. So first of all, I'd like to um, ask Dan and John about their experiences. And first of all, I'll talk, turn to, to Dan. Dan, thanks for, for sharing your experiences with, with Amelie. Um, just thinking back to the time when you were trying to find out what was going, going wrong and what was, what was the explanation for the the symptoms that you observed. What were your experiences about finding answers to your questions that you had at that time? It was nearly impossible because even thinking back 10 years ago, we didn't have the kind of power of social media in a sense of finding communities, even for undiagnosed conditions. And they're searching on the internet. You put anything in for your child, you know, in the case of family, stopping to walk or stopping to crawl. You things you get like brain tumors, you just get horror stories that come up. And so you, you go to the GP and you're already nervous and worried about what they're going to talk to you about. And then when they don't really know what's happening to your child, you then do more searches and you just don't find anything that you can take away to understand. And nothing was ever patient centric as well. I found that it was all really um, medical jargon, medical terminology, which, you know, when you're a new parent, you with a child who's suffering from something you don't understand, it's very difficult to understand the information that's presented to you. So it's a very challenging time. Mm. Turning to you, you, John, I mean, you've, you've probably ex experienced um, working with lots of families who've have struggled at that time. What, what would you regard as being the biggest problems around that, that time of trying to find a diagnosis? Absolutely. I mean, it's something that me and Dan have uh, talked about extensively is that it, we may represent different... Oh, Tim, there's just some comments coming in about the mic rubbing sound that's causing a little bit of inf interference. Just to make you aware of that. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so it may be different conditions, but the experience is is very similar. And especially with a complex condition like Neiman Pick, um, of which there are two different forms, um, the SMD type A and B is on a broad spectrum. And without going too far into it, type a is um, that those who have the children who have are affected by that they don't live past their third birthday. Oftentimes, they pass away in the first year of life. But type B, on the other end of the spectrum, they often live to the fifties and sixties. And there's a you know a therapy uh, at the minute which uh, stabilizes the, the symptoms and, and live a normal normal life. And so, if you are just getting this diagnosis, and that's just one of the forms of the condition. If you're getting this diagnosis and you're reading this without context and without um, a full perception of what this information means, that can just be damaging for families and can make a bad situation even worse. The same with type C, which if you were to read an article from five to 10 years ago, 
it would probably list it as a pediatric condition. So uh, perhaps you have a, a child who's in the 30s or 40s, actually, and you think, well, it can't be type C because I've read this article. Well, we learn new things every, every year. And you know the things which we thought true 10 years ago uh, aren't true today. And so this misinformation, you know, these, <laughs> these pages don't go anywhere. They often stay up and you could go on Google and find information, which is uh, it's now, you know, that disinformation that you're talking about, Tim. And so that early diagnosis is when we want the information to be streamlined, to be uh, trustworthy and verified. And that's what I think we offer um, in our organization. And by pairing with you, that's why it's an exciting partnership, is that we can get that to families and GPs and clinicians as soon as possible. Um, because just to give another you know, real life example in terms of this is that someone can read something and especially with a complex condition like Neiman Pick, the symptoms can be so similar to other conditions is that it can be disregarded. Um, there's someone that I'm thinking of, of course, who has passed recently, um, but didn't get their Neiman Pick diagnosis until the last year of their life. And it was thought before that they had ataxia and before that, oh, maybe, you know, they can't handle their drink before that, oh, they're just clumsy. You know, all of these, just a, a life lived with misinformation. Um, and ataxia being only one of those symptoms for the condition. And so that's why we just have to make sure that we have trustworthy information and that we don't just go off what people say and we don't just go off you know, what we read on Facebook, that's for sure. Um, and so that's why we really need to provide something like this. And it's, you know, it's, a, it, it's a gap um, which is going to help many people. Great, thanks, John. And apologies for my mic causing problems. I switched to a headset. I hope that's better. Yeah, come um, on, come on. Right, I'll just stop sharing the screen for a second. Um, and thanks, John, also for mentioning about um, how Neiman Pick UK is now partnering with Cognizant Group to help get information out. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so thank, it's really, we're really excited about that. And, and turning back to, to Dan, thinking about, um, I'm, I'm sure you turned online to try to find answers. What were some of the issues that you had looking for you know, answers in your, in your particular case? And, 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 and what, what lessons can we learn from that? Well, the first thing was, if I think about post-diagnosis first, when, when Emily was diagnosed, the first thing we were told, do not Google it. And you're like, why? I mean, like, this is a this is a horrific disease. You don't need to read what's online. Of course, the first thing you do is you Google it and then you read these horror stories. And there's actually there was no information really about managing the disease. It's all about death. Because with Tay Sachs, unfortunately, when the kids are diagnosed with infantile or a late infantile form, you know, average and life expectancy is about five years of age, and you're sitting there with um in our case, a 15-month-old child who's smiling and happy, but just has stopped walking and crawling, and you have no idea really what the future's going to hold. And for us, what was really difficult was to get in our head that she was going to die at some point, and that journey, from what we were reading, was going to be tomorrow. And you're, you're looking at this child who, who's actually happy, smiling, as I said before, but there's going to be a period of deterioration, and not understanding really what the, the disease was going to be. And then not really having any information about how you can make the most of your time as a family, which is really mm -hmm. important. It's like with, with Neiman Pick at the Cats Foundation, we've done a lot of work in making families aware there's so much you can do together and sharing the right information and sharing that information at the time. But again, before before she was diagnosed, she was um, went for a, a, an appointment uh, for ophthalmology because they can look at the back of the eye for a thing called a cherry red spot, and that's an indication for me metabolic um, disease. I remember you know, she had the test. It's relatively simple. Um, so then the um, ophthalmologist got her senior consultant in. He had a look. Then he got two more colleagues in to all have a look at her eye. And we're sitting there on a Friday evening. I've only been in hospital for, for the week. And we've just been sent down to this clinic. And then they were all just there. And they're like, wow, we've, we haven't seen this. Or one's seen it once before. And this is a cherry red spot. It's a sign of a metabolic disorder. And I remember we asked them, what does that mean? And they were like, well, if... On, on the worst case scenario, it's not good. On our best case scenario, it's still really bad. And that's all we got told. And then we got sent off. Again, we started searching for information about cherry red spot. And all you were getting are journal articles. You're not getting anything about actually what it means in relation to a metabolic disorder or any of those diseases. And so having access to accurate information 
is so, so important at the, the time to deal with a diagnosis or a potential diagnosis, because you have to prepare yourself as a parent or carer. That's the kind of the key thing. And what we're always um, driving home with our families is you have to be prepared before the diagnosis and after that you can then think clearly and plan a strategy in terms of are the treatments, can you improve quality of life or can you just make the most of your time together? I think that's really important. Once you're armed with the right information, you can make the right decisions. And, you know, that's got better. It can still do better. I mean, a lot better, actually. But 10 years ago, it was actually really bad. And I was saying to John before, Emily's diagnosis was done with um, a printout, uh, sorry, a photocopy of a printout of, you know, a Google search, and that was it. So you kind of walk away and that's all you get. It's, just, it's better now, but it was very difficult at the time. Yes, yeah. Well, I think a lot of people have also been advised not to Google symptoms or the diagnosis and looking at, at the chat. Um, so, so there's definitely a problem about not enough information, but also I think as Nicola mentioned in the last session, it's also overwhelming to be given too much information, particularly when you're handed a big uh, leaflet uh, that, that may not cover exactly, uh, and you have to sort of di dissect what, what applies to you. Did, did you experience that too? But one has been given too much information. I think we were, I don't think we were given enough at diagnosis, and then we suddenly got a flurry of information, and then it was just too much. So you went away thinking, "What is this?" You do Google search; it's scary, and then a couple of weeks later, you go back for another another appointment, and then you're just given like dumped booklets that have been created. This was 10 years ago. These books were created 10 years previously. And it was just, it was horrific. And you, you're just reading, you know, I remember one of the, one of the sections was uh, planning, funeral planning and stuff like that. And you think, right, I know I need to deal with that, but I don't need to be dealing that with in four months of diagnosis. That's something mm. we talk about. This isn't a disease where someone walks in and they pass away within, you know, three months. There is a, a timeline attached to it. So that, that's really important that people are given information at the right time to digest it. Same with seizures, the same with feeding tubes. These are all things in the disease you have to deal with, but not at the very beginning. You need to know about it, but you don't need to know the details of how do you manage dysphonic spasms? How do you manage, you know, an inability to swallow? Yet you will have to, but you don't need it at the beginning. If you're drip fed information at the right time, you can then make the right decision. You don't feel overwhelmed. And I think that's really important. Mm. Yeah. Great. Um, thanks, Dan. Um, and I think we've got lots of questions coming in, which is great. So we'll, we'll, we'll make sure that we try to address as many as we can. Um, but we've got a poll that I'd just like to run now to try to get a flavour from the audience's experience of this coming, coming back to the topic about the consultation and how, how of, often it's very hard to, to remember what's being discussed. So even if you've had a good consultation, remembering what's being discussed. So I'd like everybody to take part in this poll. And the question is, uh, if you think back to the time when you had a consultation about yourself or, or relative, um, um, probably around the time of um, early, early on, how much of the information that was discussed in the consultation were you able to clearly remember afterwards? So we, I think we've all been in that situation where you've had a consultation, you've gone, gone back and your mum or your husband or wife says, well, what did the doctor say or what did the nurse say? Um, how much were you able to clearly remember and able to relate back? Great, well, we're getting a fantastic number. We're up to over 60 responses, so it's really good. And just very quickly on this one, this is, this is an example. So when Emily was diagnosed, I, I got the disease name wrong. They, they said it could be, well, the ophthalmology could be, it could be Tay-Sachs, Neiman Pick, MRD. I was going around searching Neiman Sachs, Tay Pick, all sorts of combinations of names, and I wasn't getting anything. So yeah. you just forget at that moment. Great. So if I end the poll, hopefully every, everyone's going to be able to see it. We've got 73 votes now. So I'll share the results. No, I can't actually see if everyone can see the results. Can you see the results? Yeah. Great. So we have all of it, 3%. Need all of it, 14%. Most of it, 25%. About half of it, 30%. Less than half of it, 19%. Very little of it, 10%. Uh, 
and no, no percent on nothing. So yeah, so that's really quite quite a result, isn't it? it shows yeah, that in our experience that. of over seventy of seventy people, a good sample. Um, if you add them up, um, that's over sixty percent remembered less than half of the information after consultation. And um, I think Paul has made a really good point in the chat, but that's if you've understood what what was said. So there's the there's a there's a joint problem of remembering um, if, if information, but also being able to comprehend it. Great. Well, thanks for everyone for taking part in that poll. I'm just going to share the screen again. Uh, so, in fact. We must slide on. Um, the data shows very similar result actually. That some published data from a few years ago actually, but I think very reliable shows that you know on average um, we uh, forget about forty to eighty percent of the information that's discussed with us in the consultation. So that really uh, rings true with what we found in our experience today on the session. Um, so in fact, you could say that the majority of information uh, we forget immediately after consultation. So you know, I think that we need to think of new ways of communicating information around a consultation because that really is uh, you know, devastating. Um, but compounded with that is the fact that um, it's very hard to understand sometimes the jargon that's used and, and discussed and the terminology. And of course, healthcare is very complex. So it's very hard for, for anyone, no matter how old or how literate they are, to be able to understand all the information. And a, a very interesting study that was published a few years ago in the British Journal of General Practice looked at the literacy of the general population and the literacy level that you'd be required to have to be able to understand the typical health informa information leaflet. And they found that 43% of the population could not be expected to understand a typical health information leaflet. And this was really looking at health information leaflets for common things like diabetes and hypertension and heart disease and stroke. I think when it comes to rare diseases, uh, it's, it's even harder because some of the concepts are incredibly difficult to, to understand. And all of this leads to you know, delays in diagnosis, unnecessary repeat consultations, poise for treatment, low satisfaction, and you know, worst of all, bad outcomes. So I'm very pleased uh, to uh, mention today about uh, how Cognitive Group has developed a service to try to help to address this. Uh, we've developed a platform called Healthy Note. It's a freely available platform and what we're aiming to do here is to provide a service so that patients and the public and relatives and carers can receive recommended information from healthcare professionals. And we're very pleased to announce today that Neiman Pick UK is now part of this. We're working with over, over 40 charities now, uh, and we're starting to add in rare disease charities and patient groups uh, to ho hopefully extend our service across a wider range of conditions you can see here that over 11,000 GPs are already using the platform uh, and representing about 1,600 practices. And it's a very simple system and it enables patients to get information that's been recommended to them. And patients really appreciate that because it, it shows that the healthcare professionals are trying to help them with the follow-on information and help, helping them to understand and cut through this misinformation that they might otherwise find online. And uh, we have a library of over four and a half thousand pieces of content now coming from a range of different sources. We have different formats because having content in different formats is very important. So that includes traditional text and articles, videos, and even apps. We're working with Orca so that recommended apps can also be included in that information description. And I'd, so I'd like to encourage people to, uh, to try it as a, as a, a general public. You can go to healthnet.com and use the search tool. Um, so you don't have to wait for your clinician to send you an information prescription, um, but you may well get sent one and you might get that by text or email or even a QR code on a letter. Uh, so if you do receive one in the future, you'll know what to expect. So you can use it as a combination of information that's been recommended to you, but also use it as a search tool for information that's been selected uh, to be of high, high standard. So let's go back to the discussion and pick up some of the questions that have been uh, mentioned. And I think just, just to kick off, John, one of the things that you talked about uh, when we talked before today was, was how sometimes 
old information is available online when new information has come to replace it. What sort of a problem does that cause? Outdated information on, online, I, I, I mean. Yes, absolutely. Well, first of all, sorry, Tim, I got overexcited and I mentioned uh, the partnership earlier on. But, uh, <laughs> that's good. <laughs> it's just, <laughs> but um, yeah, so that's that's the issue is that that old information, it doesn't go anywhere, as I mentioned, you know, it's still floating around on Google. And when you're, when you, especially during the, that first diagnosis, you just want to find everything, um, you know, is, is what families report. And that means that you're going to get confused by the old information, new information. Possibly you'll lean towards the, the less severe, you'll be hopeful that, you know, that would be true. But this is the thing with Healthy Note is that it links directly to the, well, in our case, in our patient support group's website. And that information, which is streamlined, we, we know how the families um, respond to just being inundated with a heavy amount of information. Um, our chief executive, Tony Matheson, she's, you know, um, Redzi's mother and also, you know, supports the charity. And so she has that background and she goes through with it, fine tooth comb, and she, she knows how families will respond to these types of things. So by being linked to Healthy Note through our website, that means that when we update something, if, if there are new findings, or then that will be updated as well. There's no chance of that old information being found and someone being led down, you know, a different path. Um, and it also means that indirectly when they're on our website that means they're linked to us and they're going to get that support that emotional support um, and being linked with the families other families and then that isolation will be reduced so it's it, it's it's bigger than just health information in my opinion um and but yeah it just just cuts out that that misinformation that disinformation mm -hmm. yeah, great thanks john and uh, kirsty and sophie in the chat have made two comments that i think come well, quite well together one of them is that you know, we all tend to, if we don't understand something, we, we tend to just nod our heads and go along with it rather than actually say, sorry, I haven't understood. Um, and we also don't feel comfortable to give feedback, um, particularly to a healthcare professional sometimes to, to say, I'm sorry, I, I don't think you've answered my question or I haven't understood what you've said. What, what, what do you think about it, Dan? Is that your experience? And how, how you know, should, can we become more confident to, to feedback when we haven't understood something? No, we should do. And this is this is the thing I'm sure everyone here will agree. You're told in the rare side, you get the diagnosis and you're always told you're going to become the expert. This is so rare. You're going to know everything about it. And it's really daunting because you're sitting there either being diagnosed yourself or as the, the parent carer, being told by, by a clinician, a specialist who's been in the profession you know, for many years because they're on a very ultra rare disease and they're telling you that you're going to be expert telling them so you suddenly start thinking fine okay so I need to know what they're going to talk to me about but then no one really sits and explains all this stuff to you you kind of go to consultations they're throwing multiple terminologies at you you know prognosis what's going to happen and you really struggle and it can you feel because you're being told you're going to be expert that you shouldn't really be asking questions because they see you as the expert as well and so it's really important that we we get confidence to challenge and ask questions to, you know, the doctors and the clinicians to make sure that we get the answers we need. Because a lot of this is directly linked then to um, to care, the best practices, and and looking at kind of future treatments as well. And I think that this is where advocacy makes such an important role because we can empower our families and we always say that's our role in advocacy to empower parents carers and patients that they can take control of their health but to do that you need good health information and the information coming from us is is a trusted source because we know the disease with many of us especially on the rare side with the kitchen top charities how we start we've lived the experiences so we can actually tell people the questions you should ask and what you need to understand i think that's really important the empowerment side but also the challenging side Great, thanks, Dan. So I had that classic, someone at the door during a live webinar. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I think we've only got a minute left. Um, so, and there's a comment, I think it's very important about digital exclusion. And clearly uh, there are some people for whom, you know, digital can be difficult to use. It's, it's not necessarily age, it can be other uh, uh, things. So, what, what, you know, how, how do you think we can, we can make the best use of digital without excluding those who for one reason or another prefer not to use digital or, or can't use digital john what do you think about that 
That's interesting. Well, I, I think that it's it's not just for patients and families. And so, you know, it, it, if, it's, if it's going to be these in-person consultations that you, you were talking about, then they can get that information one-on-one uh, -on -one, uh, in a more conventional manner. And then also it'll help support groups like ourselves. And we, we've got some families who, uh, you know, live on the other end of the country and we, we, we value these in-person connections. That's actually how charities like ourselves thrive. And it's actually um, the best thing about us, I think. And so we don't want to ever go totally digital. And if it can help inform professionals who can then pass that on to families, um, because for whatever reason they don't feel comfortable, then Healthy Nook can still, you know, fill that gap. Mm, great. It's a bit like the Pareto principle, isn't it? If, um, if we can use digital to help at least 80%, then it saves time for, so that we can use other traditional methods to, to, to help the, maybe perhaps the 20% or whatever it is. Uh, so digital can help free up time, can't it, for, for, for busy clinics? Yeah, great. Well, I think we've we've run out of time, haven't we, Gemma? Um, but thank you very yeah. much, Dan and John. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dan, John and Tim, for a very interesting um, session. And thank you for everybody who put comments in the chat as well to, to sort of make this discussion um, very, very um, um inclusive and, and 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 we wouldn't have a discussion if we didn't have comments in the chat so thank you all for, for contributing um, and please do all head over to the networking event now on the remo platform i've put the um the link there in the chat so if you'd like to pick up these discussions that you've been having please do head over to the networking um event on the remo platform if or if you want a bit of quiet down downtime please spend a bit of time in our exhibit hall and gallery and and have um a bit of time to, to look at what's what's available there so um look forward to seeing you over in the networking session um and and we can pick up the conversation there and please do tune in for our um, Dragon's Den later on, because I think we've got quite a few um, um, groups who are looking to address some of these challenges with respect to health information. So um, see you all there too. Okay, thanks very much, Tim, John and Dan. Thank you. Thank you, bye-bye.